Okay, our next speaker is Eddie, who's going to talk about learning generalized reactive policies. All right, thank you for the introduction, and I guess I'll jump right in. And so the motivation here um, is that we want to plan faster in robotics, and that's the motivation everywhere. And for a concrete example, we have, say, a robot in a warehouse, and it's performing different tasks, uh, say, go to point A, point B, grab object C, take it back to point D, and it's doing this all in the same warehouse. And the main idea is that if we've already planned through a part of the warehouse previously, and we need to plan through that part again, we want to do so faster in the future. And so this is a mature idea in the planning literature. Um, everybody is looking into it. And our goal for this work is to see if we can use recent advances in deep learning and see if they can help with this. So we limit ourselves to uh, deterministic task planning, and the problems we consider are usually solved as follows. You build a representation via PDDL or strips, and then this is typically a manual step, which you then pass into an automatic planner, and that returns a policy or a sequence of actions, and policies map observations to actions. And Sokoban and TSP are examples of such problems. So the the key insight is that we can view the planning algorithm as a mapping from a current observation, a goal observation, to an action. And the, the assumption that we make is that the observation contains enough information to fully determine both the domain and the state of the problem. So for example, in Sokoban, we have an image, and the image contains the position of all the walls, it contains the position of the agent and the boxes. And so basically, the the GRP will receive this observation, it will decode the domain, and similar to a planning algorithm, return a sequence of actions. And the hypothesis is that since it receives the same information as a planning algorithm, uh, it, you know, we may be able to learn something like the planning computation. And the way we chose to train this policy is via behavioral cloning. And we do so as follows. We generate some random instances. We solve them using some off-the-shelf planners, such as Llama. And then we train the GRP to output the same mapping from an observation to an action. And note that for the second step, we're not limited to using a planner. This can be any black box um, planning algorithm. Could be a human. Could be another robot in a different warehouse. OK, so we have this general structure that we defined and a way to train it. So we want to answer the following questions. So what makes a good architecture? What can we put inside? We want something that's capable of representing the planning computation that needs to happen, something that's expressive enough. Once we have that, can we learn non-trivial policies? And then can we learn policies on smaller domains and have them generalize to bigger domains? And finally, can we use this generalized reactive policy with a planner to improve um, classical planners? And so here's the architecture that we settled on. Um, since Sokoban can be represented naturally as an image, and there's been a lot of work in image processing neural networks, we decided to adopt convolution layers, and we built a deep convolutional neural network specifically with 14 layers, and on the next slide, I'll explain why 14. At the end of the network, we predict a probability over actions, and we also predict the plan length uh, to the goal. And both of these predictors share the first half of the convolution layers. And finally, we have skip connections from the input layer to every convolutional network, and these are just a direct mapping. And these are known to be useful in image processing networks. So in short, empirically, we evaluated the, the depth. And more convolutional layers resulted in better performance. And that makes sense because depth corresponds to the amount of computation that could be done. And note that it was the depth that improved performance and not necessarily the number of parameters, because when we evaluated networks with the same number of parameters, but shallow, they performed strictly worse. And performance flattened out at 14 layers, and that's probably because the deeper a network gets, the harder it is to train it. And 
we also evaluated the performance of skip connections. The green bar is without skip connections. The blue bar is success rate with skip connections. And you can see there is a significant difference. So here's an example of a policy we were able to learn. And all this is doing is predicting the next action. And this evaluation was on test maps that were never before seen and not part of the training set. And as you can see, it looks to be doing something um, that has the appearance of look-ahead planning. And this was surprising because it was mostly learned, uh, it was actually only learned using supervised learning. So what's going on? Uh, we wanted to see, try to evaluate what's going on in this architecture. And so we looked at standard methods for visualizing convolutional neural networks. Those didn't provide to be useful. So we started looking at failure modes. And the most common failure mode is cyclic actions. And they're mostly a consequence of a deterministic policy. We can easily mitigate this with a stochastic policy, but that results in a uh, non-zero chance of picking dead end states. So in a continued effort to figure out, well, actually, yeah, in a continued effort, we, we looked at more failure modes. And the second most common failure mode was the inability to deal with long-term dependencies between actions, like really long-term. And here's an example. You have two objects. You move the first one down to the goal. And the moment you put the object on the goal, the agent is actually stuck. There's, there's no way to recover from this. And that's not actually clear until 24 steps later when the second object is moved to that um, bottom square. We also evaluated uh, various metrics, two of which are plotted here. On the left, oh, there it goes. Yes. So on the left, we have uh, the success rate as a function of plan length. And you would expect that longer plans are harder, and that's exactly what we see. As plan length increases, success rate decreases. We also evaluated success rate as a function of planning time of LAMA in the FD system. And you would expect that if the planner has a hard time solving a problem, then it must be harder. Uh, however, in this case, it, it was almost the case, except that weird jump at the end, where the planner took a long time to solve these problems, but the learned policy was able to solve them easily. So what's going on here? On the left, we have right here, we have an example of a problem that was hard for a planner. And the planner took, in this case, eight seconds to solve it. And as you can see, it actually looks like a very simple problem, uh, a lot of open space. And that's exactly what made it take longer. The open space induces a high branching factor. So the planner has to do useless exploration. And on the right, we have an example of a problem that looks harder, but the planner was able to solve it much faster. And that's because the walls partition the space into chunks that are connected by corridors. And in both cases, the generalized reactive policy was able to solve these quickly. And so it gives us some, you know, a, a little more insight that the learn policy isn't really doing a planning computation. Maybe it's doing something more like we would intuitively do. Key takeaway is high branching factor on easy tasks result in slow planning. So I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with neural networks. They, they know they're just a black box. We can't give any guarantees for the neural networks. And so what if we want the 100% success rate that conventional planners give us? Well, in this case, since we were able to get 87% success rate, we know that some structure must have been learned. And so we can exploit this structure and use it in conjunction with uh, some kind of search algorithm, such as A-star or greedy search. And this instantly gives us a completeness guarantee. And if the learned structure is relevant, this should improve performance. So in Sokoban, we use the plan length as the heuristic. So we compare the performance of the heuristic with A star. That's in blue. We compare the heuristic with uh, greedy search, which is in green. And we compare that against the Manhattan heuristic, which is orange and red. And we also compare it against auto-generated heuristics in purple and brown. And as you can see, uh, so on the left, we have the number of states explored. 
and that's on a logarithmic scale. Um, and on the right, we have the plan length. And as you can see, the plan length for the heuristic is very close to the plan length from coming out of the planner. However, the number of states explored was orders of magnitude lower. And it was actually orders of magnitude lower than all the other approaches. So the GRP effectively learned some structure of the plans. So now that we have this heuristic, uh, we might want to use it on larger maps. However, the fact that we can use it on larger maps may not be immediately clear. And the good news is that we use convolution layers, which are size independent. And that's because in a convolution layer, we learn the weights on the filter. And the way the filter is applied is by sliding it along the image. And so the filter size is fixed, but not the image size. We can apply that to any image size. The bad news is that at the end, we have a couple fully connected layers, which are not size independent. And so to address that issue, we use a trick from the image segmentation literature, in particular, fully convolutional networks for image segmentation. And the way image segmentation works is at the final layer, there's a window around every pixel to classify every pixel. But in our case, we don't really care about every pixel. We only care about the region around the agent. And so what we do is we apply this window centered around the agent right before sending it to the fully connected layers. And that gives us a size independent architecture. So here's the performance of generalization. In this case, again, we have uh, states explored on the left, uh, plan length on the right. And we train on 9 by 9 maps and evaluate them on larger maps. And as you can see, the plan length in blue, which is our heuristic with A star, is very comparable to the plan length coming out of the planner. However, on the left, there, as the size of the domain increases, there is some degradation in performance but it's still orders of magnitude quicker than the planner and still quicker than the Manhattan heuristic. So now we have a uh, heuristic that effectively generalizes. It also uh, seems to help with the planning speed. So we want to use this for progressive self-improvement. We want a heuristic for very large maps, but we may not want to use the planner on those maps directly. So what we do is we start with a small map uh, we solve them using a slow planner. This gives us some training data, which we use to train the GRP. Then we use the learned policy with a star to solve a slightly bigger map. This gives us new training data, which we use to retrain the GRP, and we continue. And in this manner, we get to large maps without having to use the, some automated planner directly. Or maybe we don't even have access to a planner for larger maps, so we can still progressively build up. So we evaluate this architecture on, or this, the, the planning, uh, leapfrogging this algorithm on the TSP. And TSP is naturally represented as a graph. And as you can see, the architecture looks very similar to what we had previously. But instead of image convolution, we use graph convolution networks. And graph convolutions are a generalization of image convolution. So again, on the left, we have the number of states explored. And we compare the leapfrogging algorithm, which is in orange, to uh, minimum spanning tree heuristic, which is in green. As you can see, it performs much better. And we also evaluate a non-generalized neural network heuristic, which was trained on data, directly on data of the same size. And the two are very close in performance, the blue and orange. Again, on the right, we compare the relative cost. And we evaluate a lot of different approaches here. We evaluate a greedy policy, which is in blue, followed by a neural network that just predicts an action over all the nodes, just selects a node that's in green. Then we have a, and that's generalized. It's trained on a small map. Then we have the, in red, a generalized heuristic, followed by leapfrogging in orange. And finally, a non-generalized approach in purple. As you can see, once again, leapfrogging has, is very close in performance to a non-generalized approach. So to conclude, uh, in this work, we wanted to leverage uh, 
deep learning advances to see if they can help in the learning to plan context, we proposed a simple idea where we train this policy purely using behavioral cloning and given an expressive network with enough data, we were able to learn non-trivial plan-like behaviors. And we also show that this policy can generalize across task instances, it can generalize across domain sizes, and finally we can combine this with uh, some kind of classical planning algorithm as a heuristic that builds on the learned structure in the problems. So there's a lot of related work. Uh, some of the most relevant ones would be AlphaGo Zero. And they, they also learn a kind of heuristic for Monte Carlo tree search. And they have an automated curriculum, which they build via self-play. However, it's not clear how to do that in a single agent goal-directed problem. Then there's also evaluation networks, action schema networks. Those have uh, explicit planning architecture. And finally, there's um, learning combinatorial optimization over graphs, and uh, that work is the, the closest one to our work. Their architecture is very, very similar to what we have, except they use reinforcement learning instead of supervised learning. And so there's a lot of things we can do in the future. Uh, we want to generalize this architecture. Uh, we still want to use the input that's most natural for the problem. So in Sokoban, we have uh, images. In TSP, we have a graph. But, but in a way, we want to generalize that to other problems. And we also want to build uh, a curriculum. So if we learn to solve, let's say, a one-object Sokoban, we want to use that information to solve two-object Sokoban. We also want to look into learning to fix mistakes. So kind of like a human would do, you, you move the object around, and then you realize that's not the way to go, so you move it back. And that would be an interesting thing to learn. And finally, one of the most important things would be the interpret interpretability of these networks to see, you know, figure out what they're actually doing, what kind of computation they're learning. Are they breaking up the problem into subtasks, or are they learning a heuristic? I mean, our guess is that it's probably doing a combination of the two. Thank you. Questions? So just wanted to confirm the key difference you would cite between this and Sam Toya et al's work was reinforcement learning. Uh, the, the combinatorial? Yeah. No, the, the fourth paper you cited. Sam yeah, Toya, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. The, they use reinforcement learning. Yeah. Right. Um, and then the other thing that maybe you can talk about with these connectionist models which convolute um, on a grid or a graph. If I give you uh, sokol band graphs with higher and higher and higher resolution, and let's say the only obstacle is the hand of a clock which rotates in the middle. So it just it gets further and further away, and you start randomly in that grid. Okay. And what happens to the performance of, of the search? So, so you're saying the, uh, the agent gets smaller and the obstacles grow bigger? Well, I mean, the agent is a fixed size, but the grid gets a higher, sure, higher sure. dimensional grid. But it's the same pattern. It's just um, you start off by you know, 300, 300 pixels, then 3,000, 3,000, 30,000, 30,000. Oh, no. so, so just everything's the same size, just higher resolution. And yep. so, yeah, I mean, neural networks just, uh, especially convolutional neural networks, do struggle with that. Yeah. Because if you, if you give them training data on images that are scaled and then, or, or tiny, and then you scale them up, they struggle to identify yeah. what they were trained on. Yeah. So do you think there's a, something from connectionism we can bring to that? Or, I mean, because, you know, the number of layers uh, increases the amount of history that you can code? I mean, do you think there's some architecture and some cues to these, especially like the 2D models? Do you think there's some cues to what the architecture should look like? I mean, both your and Sam's work, uh, there's a little bit of black magic in terms of sort of figuring out what the architecture of the network is. Yeah, I mean, we can definitely exploit uh, architecture to solve these problems better. Um, but I think in this work, I wanted to stick to the, using the, the most natural input for a problem without having to you know, convert it to a different format. And so like in Sokoban, it, 
uh, it's naturally represented as an image. And I mean, one way to address the, the resolution case is that we can have, um, we can learn potentially or like post train some uh, downsampling layers and then pass that to what we already learned. Yeah. Okay, just time for one quick question. Um, correct me if I'm wrong here. So these are essentially domain dependent techniques. I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? This is essentially a domain dependent technique, right? So this is a solution for Sokoban is different from a solution for TSP. Or your That's right, network, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So have you compared to domain dependent solvers for Sokoban or TSP? Have I compared to? Ha yeah, so there, there are domain dependent solvers for Sokoban, there are domain dependent solvers for TSP. Uh, yeah, I see. Yeah, always, I mean, right? um, we use we use Llama to solve so Sokoban. So that's a domain independent planner. Yeah, that, that is a domain independent planner. But your technique is domain dependent. Have you compared to domain dependent techniques for those? Oh, well? domain dependent. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons was because it was difficult to extract any information from these. Uh, domain dependent solvers. I mean, I tried to look for some domain dependent solvers, but um, not all of them give me the information for like States Explored or. Yeah. It's easy to find TSP solvers. Well, Sokoban. Uh, Sokoban solvers does also exist. Do you, um, do you have one from the top of your head? I think that's Rolling Stone. They will give you the names oh. of land. Um, <laughs> Actually, I do remember. Yeah, I I, I first used J um, J Soko, but I quickly abandoned that because it was way too slow compared to using Llama. Well, okay. Uh, that's surprising. Okay, let's take the rest of line. Yeah. And thank you again.